Our third speaker for today is Fabio Capitania. He comes originally from Italy, but on his way to Monash, he swung past the ETH in Zurich to complete his PhD in geophysics. Fabio first started here in 2007, working in the area of plate tectonics, resulting in numerous journal publications and also a book chapter. Fabio has won several ARC discovery projects and is currently supported on an ARC DECRA. According to his Italian education, there is no boundary between science and art, and Fabio is known not only as a scientist, but also a musician and an artist. He's done art exhibitions all over Europe, including the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, and he's also worked as an art journalist. Today, Fabio is talking on the topic, when two worlds collide, building the highest mountains of the world. Please welcome Fabio. So I just want to talk, you, talk to you about uh, what my research is, in more broadly in general. So where do we start? We start from a simple observation, something that we all have experienced. The surface of our planet is divided into part of the planet is, uh, is uh, covered by water and another part is uh, emerged. Another uh, simple observation we have about the emerged areas of the, our planet is that there is some topography. Uh, this is a typical example, uh, one that I really like, is the South American plate in which you can see that it's surrounded by uh, the ocean, the Pacific and the Atlantic on the other side, and then there is part of the South American plate that is quite plain, and another part that is a very high uh, cordillera, so called, is a mountain chain called the Andes. Uh, to have a look in details, you can see on the left there is uh, the shape of the South American chain, it's longer than 6,000 kilometers, one of the longest in the world. On the right side you see a little bit of profile north to south and you can see that it's quite tall. There are parts north and south that are around uh, three to four kilometers and another part which is called the plateau divided in the Altiplano and the, Pl and the Puna. Uh, there are around five uh, kilometers and this would be in the bottom uh, a cross section is to west where you see the, the dashed line. Uh, for those of you that haven't been there, this is a really big mountain. When you go there you, you're impressed with how flat can be on the top and how uh, high can reach on the, on the, on the height over there. Um, why this is over there and why this is exactly in between a big continent and another ocean? Well, this is what is called plate tectonic theory. I'll make it short. It's something that now we're going to celebrate 50 years since this paper, uh, in which this uh, smart guy from Canada, uh, John Tuzo Wilson, realized that these plates on the surface, uh, the, the surface of the Earth is subdivided in many plates, so tessellated with uh, these rigid plates. These rigid plates, they do move, we don't see them moving, but rest assured they do move. Uh, and then eventually they converge, like this one in uh, the, the oceanic plate of the Pacific towards South America, and in their convergence, eventually, in this collision, they create this type of mountains. This was an idea that was uh, born long ago, uh, we have a little bit more of understanding nowadays, and you see in the cartoon over there that this is what is called an Andean type margin. So we do see the plates that converge, and eventually the oceanic plate, the oceanic lithosphere with the oceanic crust converge towards the other one, uh, the continental one, and eventually rubbing together, they create this, uh, these mountains. We also know that these plates from the surface they go inside the, the Earth interiors, a uh, process called subduction. But there is something that is quite funny uh, about this picture, is that we do understand that, or at least we, we know that, and we know that this specific pl plate is going everywhere and subducting all over, but as you can see, the only place all over this, uh, this specific plate that has these high mountains is South America. All the other areas, uh, they have exactly the same, they can be expressed by the same type of cartoon, the same type of sketch, but yet they don't produce these high mountains. Uh, I must say that I consider, when I look at these kind of things, I say, well, that's funny. But I'm not the only one that says that. I'll uh, reference to one of our, you know, one of my favorite authors. That's funny indeed, but uh, underneath there might be something that has to be revealed, has to be understood, and it's going to probably lead us to some uh, interesting signs. Uh, when we look at a uh, modern version of the, of the picture that Tuzo Wilson drew long ago, this is a 2007, but it's still actual, we can see uh, actually that the GPS on the surface of the Earth measure the motions of the Earth, just like a GPS will measure uh, your car moving or your iPhone will essentially tell you where you are and which direction you're doing. Obviously, this is done with a satellite, it's a bit more precise than your iPhone, but it's nothing different from that. So we do have this idea that the plates move and collide. But, um, in principle, this is very useful, but it's not really taking us farther than what Tuzo Wilson did 50 years ago. So at this point, 
uh, another point I really love in science is we really have to face it. We, we don't know. We don't know. We don't understand. We need to do more. That was not really the right approach. So we, we've been using, in my community, some years ago, uh, some other type of approaches. And I had a look at something that uh, expresses a little bit more the deformation and the motion on Earth, which is earthquakes. This is a beautiful picture from uh, the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, no doubt that the Earth is moving. Now we can see that. And uh, this is a beautiful starry night. It is not. It's just a, a picture of um, the earthquake on Earth's surface in the 1890s, all plotted together. This is one of the ideas that essentially supports the plate tectonics theory by showing that most of the deformation is along, along what we now call plate margins, uh, the belt of fire, the ring of fire, fire where it's called around the Pacific plate, and some other parts. But there's another important information that this earthquake carry, and they travel in, within the Earth, uh, crossing some parts that have uh, uh, carrying some information about what, what's down there in the Earth. Uh, it's surprising, it might the sounds to you is not different from what we call CT scan. Uh, some of you, they know what it is, some others they've heard of. We all know essentially that we can recover some information from the human body without having to slice it down, or at least we're going to slice it on a computer. So we can do the same. We can uh, sample the Earth interiors through earthquakes without having to slice it. Um, so the pictures become a little bit more richer. So we have a surface information like topography, a motion with the arrows, the earthquakes, the red dots, and now we can also have more or less an idea on what's inside down there. So there are some parts that are uh, seismically fast, some others are seismically slow, meaning that the waves are fast or slow, and uh, we simply associated these two parts of the Earth interiors that are cold or hot. Uh, another information that we get from the interiors of the Earth comes from uh, volcanoes, that sometimes they erupt some rocks that they contain some minerals that come from within the Earth. If you take these minerals, we take it to the lab, and we crush them, we're going to observe that essentially under the stresses, the forces that we have within the Earth, they deform. So this has led essentially to one of the most sophisticated and incredibly, incredibly amazing models of how Earth works, that is the lava lamp. Now everybody knows what a lava lamp is, and this is what the Earth does. As some primordial heat, which is at the bottom, has to release it. The best way to re release it is not diffuse it away, but take some parts of the Earth, heat in it, and let it go up and uh, transport the heat on the surface, a process that is called advection. So hot stuff is going to come up, and cold stuff is going to come down. The physics of this uh, uh, lava lamp, it's embodied by something that is already known by a long time, George Stokes did it uh, centuries ago, stripped down to its core, it's just an equation that ties the gravity, the temperature, the density, the pressure, the velocity, the viscosity, fine. We solve it in numerical ways like other people have shown before me. You plug it into big supercomputers like this one, Tiane2, is currently the fastest supercomputer in the world, in China, and I'm lucky enough to collaborate with these guys over there. And uh, there it is. You get a picture of the first thousand kilometers of the Earth. Then uh, it uh, represents the subduction as we know it. And uh, no doubt that it really looks like a lava lamp. I hope you all agree. But what else we can do? So you see some blobs coming up and uh, cold stuff coming down. What else we can do with these models is then measure the velocities inside and have an idea. And then eventually compare it with what we observe on the top of these models, which is what we observe on the top of the Earth. So these plates converge. And this is the surface plate velocity. You can see these plates are <coughs> moving one towards the other. Excuse me. But we can also measure the topography. And there we go. Then we can say, OK, let's investigate a bit more. This plate, they're simply put together because one of these two is going down. See, we can have a look at the sketch over there. It's going down, creating an eddy. You can see the eddy with these arrows there, and put the two plates together. And uh, wrenching these plates together, there is something on the top that eventually will create stresses, deformation, and mountains. Uh, so this is the beautiful three-dimensional model of mine. And you can see there is a subduction process as we know it. So all the oceanic lithosphere goes down and rubs against the upper plate and creates a beautiful, very long chain of mountains. But not yet, not quite like the, the, the Andes. You can see in the Andes in this picture that they have a, a topography. So they're higher somewhere, 
uh, lower somewhere else, uh, we cannot really capture that. And that's another uh, funny moment in which you say, okay, there's something I'm missing, it's definitely not in the model, it's in the way that I see the models. So eventually it becomes a beautiful romance of many dimensions, not only three or four. And uh, I will uh, uh, resource to this beautiful picture that will essentially make uh, uh, Bruce Willis blush. Uh, but that embodies a simple concept that the heat from the Earth is coming out through the oceanic lithosphere, the oceanic lithosphere they cool down, and they do it in a way that is quite well known in physics, so essentially you leave them some time, they're going to become cooler and cooler, and the top part will become uh, thicker and thicker, just like your panna cotta or your custard pie will do, it becomes a bit more thicker on the front, on the top, and still liquid on the bottom. Give it time, and they will become thicker and thicker from the top. That's what happens on the Earth. So this is another complexity we can add. And we can sample the, the oceanic lithosphere. We know the age, 50, 40, 30, there will be million years. And eventually, simple consideration is, in the center is old, must be thick, and must be heavy. On the sides, it's very young, therefore it's thin, and must be very light. When we plug this into our numerical models, this is another model in which I have put the old and thick and heavy plate in the center and uh, surrounded by two young, thin and light portion of the plate, then eventually we get something that looks different from the model before. And how does it compare with the Andes? Well, quite well. So we can say in general there is a plateau in the center with average height there are two times, if not more, the height that we observe on the, on the side, and also this red line that you see over there is essentially the age of the oceanic plate that is abducting, and you can see that there is a correlation indeed. So this model, it's a beautiful model, explain many things, of course we can investigate, I could talk for hours about that, but probably the take home message is this one. It also gives us some insight into the stress and in particular distribution of earthquakes uh, that we have on Earth. And you can see that uh, north to south, uh, and in my model there will be top to bottom, uh, the ocean, the South American plate becomes thicker towards the center, um, and eventually what happens is that this model predicts that there is some stresses that are going to happen there, where there is this red uh, line, and eventually going towards the thicker portion of the South American plate, the stresses and the earthquakes, they must migrate it further deep. And this is more or less when you see on the right, these A, B, C panels over there, the black dots will be earthquakes. You can see that in the north, where the plate is, uh, South American plate is thinner, earthquakes are shallow, and then eventually with the thickening of the plate towards the Bolivian uh, part of the South American plate, they become deeper and deeper, and the, the occurrences on the surface are a little less um, likely. Um, that would be my take-home message, and I thank you all for listening to me.